Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Our Community, Our Health, a town hall series that facilitates a two-way conversation between researchers and community members across the country. This town hall, we're focusing on how to protect yourself and others during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our moderator tonight is Jeff Santere, co-chair for the Gainesville, Florida chapter of Right Care Alliance. My name is Jordan Leib, and I'm the communications assistant here at Health Street. Health Street is a community engagement program at the University of Florida with a mission to reduce disparities in healthcare and health research. Health Street and Right Care Alliance are dedicated to improving access to healthcare, creating opportunities for well being, and advocating for our vulnerable communities. We believe that healthcare must be affordable and accessible to everyone, no matter their age, race, gender, sexuality, or socioeconomic status. To connect with a research study or to find out more about Health Street, please go to myhealthstreet.org and browse our initiatives and services. So throughout this town hall, you can tweet your questions to us using the hashtag OCOH, or you can send questions through our Zoom meetings chat below in the Q&A functionality um, within Zoom. So with that, I'm now going to turn the floor over to our moderator. Thank you, Jordan. Bear with me. I'm sorry I had a technical difficulty and just lost my screen. <laughs> uh, I would like to thank everybody uh, for joining us tonight. Looks like we've got a great turnout. Uh, a little bit about the, the Right Care Alliance. Uh, the goal of the Right Care Alliance Patient Council is to bring patients and their families to radically transform our healthcare system into one that places the health and the well being of our patients first and delivers right care to all people. At the Right Care Alliance, we believe that right care is a human right. That is, places the health and the well-being of our patients first. It's affordable and effective. It's compassionate, honest, and safe. We believe that right care should bring healing and comfort to patients and satisfaction to clinicians. We know that achieving right care will require radically transforming how care is delivered and financed. I'd like to uh, introduce now our, our key speaker, Dr. Fred Southwick. Uh, Dr. Southwick is a former chief of infectious diseases at the University of Florida and author of the fourth edition of the textbook, Infectious Diseases, a Clinical Short Course. He's also an associate editor of the Journal of Infectious Diseases, and he's been concerned about the many false statements and misinformation that's been circulating about COVID-19. In response, he has created a series of videos through Coursera summarizing the key facts about this virus. And this evening, he will be sharing a summary of the key facts you need to know to make the proper decisions with regard to protecting yourself, your family, and your friends. Armed with this knowledge, he hopes you will share your educated views with our political leadership and with our neighbors. After his 30 minute presentation, he will be pleased to answer your questions. Dr. Fred wanted to emphasize that the views he will be sharing are his own and may not necessarily reflect the policies of the University of Florida or UF Health. Dr. Fred? Great, Jeff, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to uh, share uh, my analysis of the uh, issues we face with COVID-19. This was very unexpected, and to many of us, it has been very frightening. And I have to tell you, in my many years in infectious disease, when I saw this epidemic coming, I knew it was the most dangerous epidemic that I had ever encountered because not only does it, is it extremely infectious, but it has a significant uh, likelihood of death, a very scary situation. So whenever we are frightened, one of the best ways to actually deal with this is to deeply understand the issues and get the true facts. And the other problem I can tell you, as Jeff mentioned, is the true facts are hard to come by. There's a lot of misinformation and as an editor, I have gone through all of the material and I've tried to separate the wheat from the chaff. And that's what I'm gonna present in this presentation. I'm gonna move fairly quickly uh, because most of you do know, have some background information already. I will be repeating some things, but I'm hoping I'll put them in a context that will be logically, logical and scientifically based. So let me start with a case. And this is actually a case that I am caring for in the hospital at the present moment. Although I've changed some details because we have to acknowledge the problem of HIPAA and confidentiality. But the overall gist is the same. 
50-year-old woman presented with fatigue, shortness of breath, and fever for six days and had a history of asthma. Nine days before admission, she was exposed to COVID-19 with a COVID-19 positive patient while working in the orthopedic clinic. Seven days before admission, she experienced marked fatigue, a fever to 102, and also experienced shortness of breath. On the first day of her hospitalization, she was noted to have a fever 103, an elevated respiratory rate of 28, normal being 12 to 14, and her oxygen saturation was low, but within a range that was okay at 93% on room air. On exam, she was noted to have diffuse wheezing, and the chest X-ray showed areas of pneumonia in both lung fields. On the second hospital day, her hypoxia worsened, and she required four liters of nasal oxygen to maintain her oxygen saturation at 93. On hospital day four, she suddenly worsened, and her respiratory rate jumped from the 20s to 38, and she was noted to be severe hypoxic with the O2 sats in the 88% range, and she required intubation and was placed in the MICU. Hospitals days five through nine, she remains on a respirator on 70% oxygen and requiring a prone position, which improves ventilation. Today, actually, for the first time, we were able to drop her oxygen uh, levels to 40%. So this shows in person, the personal consequences of the SARS-CoV-2 infection. And that's the name that has been designated for this virus because it's when you look at the sequences, it most closely relates to SARS-CoV-1 or SARS, which was a virus in 2004. We call the disease COVID-19. So SARS-CoV-2 causes the disease COVID-19. And uh, when you look at the human coronaviruses, there are seven. Four are mild, low pathogenesis, and they've been around for a very long time and they cause the common cold. And uh, probably a third of colds are due to these coronaviruses. And then in 2004, the first highly pathogenic, that means uh, uh, infection that caused serious illness in humans showed up. And that particular virus uh, had about a 15 to 20% mortality. Fortunately, it was extinguished over time. However, a second uh, serious disease, mers cov uh, started in the Middle East in 2013, and that is still smoldering, and that virus has a mortality of approximately 30%. And now comes SARS-CoV-2. Now, where did this come from? Well, there are all kinds of theories, but it's very clear what happened. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is 96.2% identical with a bat coronavirus, called ARTG13. And it turns out in the bat, for reasons that aren't totally clear, the RNA replication, the replicase is less accurate and more mutations occur in bats than in humans or other animals. And it, it created some mutations, chance mutations that were uniquely adapted to humans. And then it was spread to a mammalian host called the pangolin. And that is a very valued animal in Chinese markets, and that's where it was sold, and that's where we think that we know that the epidemic started. So it is a bat virus. Now, coronavirus gets its name from the little knobs that make the virus, and this is an electron micrograph that's been colored. Uh, these knobs look like crowns, so corona means crown. And it's made up, the knob is made up of a protein called surface protein or S protein, and this particular protein, this virus can uh, withstand mar major mutations. And it so happened the mutations in this particular virus allowed it to bind to human ACE2 receptors in bronchial epithelial cells or respiratory epithelial cells with high affinity, higher affinity than SARS-1. Now, what happens when the virus binds to these receptors? It is endocytosis are taken in and then it, uh, the RNA is synthesizes a replicase, and this replicase then is responsible for reproducing the RNA, and you get multiple uh, copies of the RNA. 
Similarly, the, and also the RNA transcribes, which means that it produces proteins based on that message. And one of the proteins that is synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum is the S protein. So the RNA is uh, replicated. It forms into nuclear capsids. These nuclear capsids then bind to the outside of the endoplasmic reticulum. The surface proteins are placed on the outer surface of the virion. Then they go to vesicles. And from vesicles, they are exocytosed or released. And they release to adjacent cells. They're also released into the sputum and the saliva, explaining their highly infectious nature. Now, what happens when someone actually contracts the virions and breathes them in? Well, they initially, in the first 24 to 48 hours, they are... Uh, begin growing in the upper respiratory tract, in the nasal patches and the throat and the sinuses. And they are distinctly upper airway. And during that period, many people have very little in the way of symptoms. They may be actually asymptomatic. But after 48 hours, the virus moves down into the trachea, into the bronchus, and spreads into the alveoli. The alveoli are small air sacs that are responsible for exchanging oxygen. When the virus infects these alveoli, inflammation occurs and the walls break down and fluid leaks into the alveoli, interfering with oxygen exchange. If this continuous inflammation continues for a prolonged period of time, there may be actually thickening or scarring of the alveoli and the vessels that connect to the alveoli and interfering also with oxygenation. So what happens is the virus first is able to replicate in the upper airway, then moves to the lower respiratory tract, gets into the alveoli where it causes breakdown and leakage of fluid into the alveoli. The fluid interferes with oxygen exchange and fibrosis of the alveolar walls further impairs oxygen exchange. So now how does this virus spread? This is very important for you to understand because we are going to have to deal with this virus a considerable period of time. So it's transmitted primarily from droplets from the upper airway. Those variants go into droplets. And if you cough, you will, uh, those droplets will come out and uh, they are fairly large. So usually they drop within 1.5 centimeters. They will drop to the ground. When they drop to the ground, they will contaminate a surface and they can survive for up to three days, particularly on stainless steel and plastic. Occasionally, patients will sneeze, and this is a worry because the uh, droplets can actually project for up to six meters, or far greater than the six feet, which we usually tell people to stay separated. Also, singing and some sneezes create little droplets, aerosols, uh, droplets that are less than 10 microns, and those droplets, those aerosol, fine particles can stay in the air for three to four hours. So if you happen to walk into a closed space where someone has created an aerosol, you could inhale them and that individual might not even be there. Now it turns out stool, the, vi the virus is found there by PCR, but it is not easy to culture and we haven't seen spread from stool. And the good news, it's not spread from the mother to the fetus. So there's no perinatal spread. Now, another big worry uh, and I indicated from the initial descriptions, is that a very significant percentage of individuals are asymptomatic, and yet they're infected. Now, on the Diamond Prince cruise ship, they found that 18% of individuals that were PCR positive, that is, had the virus, had no symptoms. That was a group of elderly patients. We find that actually the more uh, uh, newer studies reveal that somewhere between 40 and 60% of patients are asymptomatic. And those that are younger are less likely to have symptoms. And particularly those under the age of 10 to 12 rarely have significant symptoms. And I want to alert you to a case called Case 31 in South Korea. And this particular individual came from Hunan, China, which is where the virus uh, begin, began, where the epidemic began. And she had no symptoms. And she went to a mega church in South Korea twice. And she also um, had a little car accident, ended up in the hospital. And then finally, she developed a little fever. And while ha she had the fever, she decided to go to a buffet. 
Well, it turns out when they did the case control investigations that she had actually exposed 1,160 people that will all develop the virus. So this is an example of the super spreader and why we don't want to open up all of society quickly because of this danger. Now, you've heard a lot about transmission and you may have heard of the word R sub zero. Now, what R sub zero refers to is one person infected, how many people are they going to affect on average? For this virus, it's somewhere between two and 2.5. Most people say it's about 2.2. That means one individual that's infected will infect on average two to 2.5 others. When you look at who becomes infected, it's usually people in families. So we see family clusters, and in China it was 80 to 85% were uh, in family clusters, and 10% for, uh, among the close contacts, 10% of family members became infected. So it usually takes a fairly long uh, exposure to contract the disease. Now let's look at the initial outbreak. Remember I said there was a, this pangolin that was sold in a market, it was the Hunan market. Uh, and what they noticed in the first bar graph here, you'll see the orange is workers. And initially it was the workers in the market that became infected. And they noticed that that was the predominance. However, within 10 days, the majority of cases in blue had never been to this market. And within 20 days, virtually everyone had not been in the market. What this showed is that we went from a point source, that is the site of the animal market, to person to person spread. And this was very rapid. Within 10 days, it was predominantly person to person spread, indicating a highly infectious agent. And indeed, when you looked at the spread in China, these are 10 day intervals. It started in the Hunan uh, and then spread through the entire province. Then it spread to other provinces. And then within a very short period of time, it has spread up the entire east coast of China. And here is Hubei is the province. This is Wuhan, the town where the market was. And you can see there was spread uh, very aggressively in these areas, but all over eastern China very, very quickly. And then from there, uh, Chinese did travel and particularly to Italy, to, to Naples, uh, for a, uh, a, 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 uh, a clothing a fashion show. And then from there, it spread uh, to the United States, probably through Italy, and spread from, to Seattle, probably from Chinese directly traveling to Seattle. So it showed up first in Seattle, as far as the United States, but there were large outbreaks as a consequence in Italy, in Spain, in England, in Portugal, and really throughout the, uh, the world, in Europe and in the United States. Now let's look at the uh, epidemic curves. And these curves are the vertical axis is the number of deaths per day. So you see, and they start this curve began when there was three deaths. T0 is when any country experienced three deaths. Right, now let's look at China. That is the, uh, the orange uh, yellowish curve. And initially that was the first, and it uh, was, this is a logarithmic curve, by the way. So it goes 1,000, 2,000. A straight line means exponential growth. And China initially had exponential growth. They, um, they uh, did a lot of interventions. And as a consequence, the epidemic has now dropped. So they are experiencing about five deaths per day. Now look at uh, South Korea. They had an early exponential, but they did a huge amount of testing and case, uh, case control studies, case investigations. And you can see they have been come flat. But look at the United States. We are still on the exponential cur curve. This is as of April 13th. Here's the United Kingdom also steep. Italy was very steep. Uh, and they did not intervene until they had 800 deaths. China intervened when they had 30 deaths. So they jumped in very quickly. And it turns out speed is of the essence when you're dealing with an exponential curve where your doubling time is, er, er, doubling time is a day to two days. And you can see that Spain has now curved over. And here is yes, or the 21st. 
uh, you can see the U.S. is starting to curve, but we are experiencing 2,000 deaths per day, far higher than any other country. You can again see that South Korea is very low and China is down to about uh, one to two deaths every other day. Now let's look at the United States. This is as of April 22nd, yesterday. And initially this epidemic began in Seattle and uh, then it spread other places. And then the second big outbreak was in New York. You can see Seattle now is, is actually quieted down due to uh, infection control measures. And the leading uh, area for infections is New York with 147,297. Second is Chicago. Third is Los Angeles. Fourth is Detroit. Fifth is the New Orleans area. And sixth is Miami. And seventh now is Seattle. I looked at, watched Florida very closely initially on, and this is March 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th. You can see the number of cases rapidly spread in many areas. And the area that began to really spread was the Fort Lauderdale and Miami area. And when I looked at the doubling time that early time, the doubling time of cases was 1.8 days. Now, since we've started uh, sheltering in place, the doubling time as of 422, when I graphed, is now for Florida is 10.1 days, a considerable improvement. In Alachua County, the doubling time is now 13.1 days, but we are still going up, we we're going up very, very slowly. Now, if you look at the overall epidemic, uh, until February 25th, China had most of the cases, but as of February 25th, the majority of cases have been outside of China. Now, what is it like to have COVID-19 and how do you make the diagnosis? Well, let's return to her case. Uh, Mark fatigue, she had fever and she had shortness of breath and she had hypoxia with an elevated respiratory rate requiring nasal oxygen. Uh, if you look at a series of 1,099 patients from China that was published in the New England Journal, uh, fever is the most common. The far, the, the intermediate bar is all patients. The light gray bar is those with mild to moderate disease and the dark bar is those with serious disease. And you see fever is present in 90 to 95% of all patients. A uh, cough is present in all patients. Uh, sputum production develops later in the simile in all patients. However, shortness of breath is much less common in mild disease in about 13%, while in severe disease it's close to 40%. Fatigue is also common in all cases, as are muscle aches or myalgias. So I like to, you, we call it an illness script, and we like to focus on four things when we're thinking about the presentation of disease. First of all, epidemiology. You wanna ask uh, any patient, did they travel? Did they travel to an, epi an endemic area? such as China, Spain, Italy, and now New York City, Los Angeles, uh, Miami, uh, or were they on a large cruise ship or in a large gathering, such as a large mega church, or were they exposed to someone that had symptoms suggestive of COVID-19? How, uh, how rapidly was the onset of the disease? It turns out that COVID-19 is acute, that is, it progresses, it develops over one to two days as our patient, or a uh, subacute uh, from three to seven days as most of the patients. So in this case, it's almost always subacute or acute onset. And the three key symptoms are fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, which is a worrisome sign. We also ask about past history. It turns out that individuals that have hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or pulmonary disease are more likely to severe, suffer severe complications from this infection and end up in the MICU. Now we make the diagnosis with polymerase chain reaction and with that's where we take a nasal and pharyngeal swab and then subject it to a polymerase chain reaction to actually measure the amount of RNA uh, from the COVID-19 virus uh, in that nasal passage. And uh, this test is about 70 to 80% sensitive and 99% specific. So if you have a positive, that definitely means you have the virus. If you have a negative, you've got about a 20 to 30% chance it's a false negative. Now, 
A big problem has been originally we focused the testing only on symptomatic individuals. What well, turned out in science article, a simulation in, in mid-March showed that, uh, suggested that for every one diagnosed, there were 10 undiagnosed patients. So that just uh, looking at the, eight, the symptomatic would miss uh, over 90% of cases. And indeed that has borne out as we've begun to test we're finding large numbers of patients that were had the infection that did not have symptoms. What does that mean to you? That means that anyone could be carrying the virus and are at risk for you contracting it. Now, testing clearly is critical when you have so many asymptomatic individuals in order to identify those that are infected, isolate them, and prevent them from spreading to others. Now, let's look at this was back in uh, March 12th, uh, but I think you'll get the point. Look at South Korea. This is the number of tests they did at this point, 274,000. As you remember, the South Korea uh, curve is very flat and decreasing. In the U.S. at that time, we had only performed 25,000 tests. Now, in order to uh, have tested for the same per capita as South Korea, which has 50 million people, we have 230 million. We should have performed at that point 1.75 million tests. So you see how woefully deficient our testing program has been. Now, what happens in the, what's the clinical course of COVID-19? Well, if you get infected, 40% mild disease, 40% moderate disease, 15% severe, and 5% critical. And of those with severe or critical disease, 38% may require mechanical ventilation. And the duration of illness, the duration of actually having to be in the hospital on average is 12 days for milder disease, 11 days, and for severe disease, an average of 13 days. As you can see, the red arrows, a certain percentage end up dying. Those with mild disease, very rare. Moderate disease, occasionally they suddenly turn worse and can die. And severe disease has a higher risk and critical disease, um, it's about a 40 to 50% mortality. Now here's the patient that I described. Here was her on day one, and this just shows her chest X-ray. You can see there are little spotty infiltrates bilaterally. This part of the lungs are clear, but you can see their X-rays are being blocked by pneumonia bilaterally. Look what happened by day eight. Her lungs are almost completely white, indicating marked progression of her illness and the development of acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. So the incubation period for this infection is usually four to six days with a range of two to 14 days. 40% have mild disease, 40% moderate, 15 severe. And severe is defined as requiring four liters of nasal oxygen to maintain an oxygen saturation of 92%. And those that require intubation have critical disease and approximately a 40% mortality. And the complications are this acute respiratory distress, distress syndrome and other organs can also fail. Now, the mortality is directly related to age. And as you can see here, individuals under the age of the orange line is the number of percent of dying. And you can see that under age 30, there are, which is, uh, doesn't take up a large fraction of the cases, Virtually no one dies. Uh, it, you really start to get a significant mortality beginning at 50 to 59 with about 2%. When you get 60 to 69 years of age, the mortality is 4%, 70 to 79, 8 to 10%. And when you're over 80, it's 16. And in Italy, it was up to 24%. So when you're over 80, this disease is often fatal. Now, how do we treat COVID-19? Well, the key is, uh, first of all, to decide who should be hospitalized. And the evidence is quite good that those that have mild to moderate disease, for the most part, can stay home and rarely will deteriorate. There, but there has to be close contact with the hospital or caregiver in case there's any deterioration. Those with moderately severe, severe or critical disease do need to be hospitalized because of the risk of deterioration. Now, there's no clear, easy way for you to decide. So you wanna call the COVID hotline, 
You can either call, call your private practitioner if you have a primary care physician, or if you don't, that hotline is the Latcher County Health Department. And it's, there's a, a complex decision tree that has to be made to decide whether you should be hospitalized or not. When you're hospitalized, the primary therapy is oxygen and supportive care. It turns out to make a very long, a long story short, all other treatments are unproven and their likelihood of benefit is, is, is very low uh, at this point. The one drug that may look promising is remdesivir, but the trials are still ongoing. The vaccine is, is uh, the potential to end this epidemic. Unfortunately, uh, they, they do have some vaccines, but the, whether the adjuvants are proper or they pick the proper uh, targets for that vaccine is unclear at this point and will require human trials. And the estimate is a minimum of a year and more likely 18 months before we have a vaccine. So that means we have to use non-pharmacologic methods to control this virus. That is, prevent people from getting it. Now, how do we do that? Well, there are five steps, and the Imperial, uh, Imperial College in England had a team that really, uh, really nice that outlined the approach and also did simulations. First of all, isolate. All those that are infected need to remain separated from others and continually wear masks and stay a distance of a minimum of six feet. For those who have come exposed to those infected individuals, they need to be quarantined. That is, they need to stay apart from others and avoid contact with others for 14 days. Uh, social distancing. Uh, one strategy is to all those over 70 who have a high mortality should stay away from others uh, and remain at home and shelter in place. The other fourth, fourth strategy is social distancing for everyone. That is, everyone shelter at home. And finally, uh, to close all schools, universities, and businesses. And the Imperial College uh, looked at two approaches. Suppression is where all those, uh, tech, uh, those methods are used. So everybody uh, is shelters in place. Schools and businesses are closed. If you do that, the R sub very zero, the number of patients infected will drop below one per infected person and the epidemic will disappear. Mitigation, you only use one and two and then four, that is uh, social distancing by everyone, but, uh, and isolation and, and quarantine. The problem there is the R sub zero will stay above one and the, the epidemic will continue to smolder. So what happens in three circumstances? We don't do anything. We mitigate or we suppress. And here are the curves, the prediction. The red line is the number of ICU beds. When you get above this red line, that means the number of the cases has outstripped the health system. They, if, you didn't, if you didn't do anything, you can see you would go way above the number of beds for ICU. And the mortality was predicted in Great Britain to be 520,000. And for the United States, if we did nothing, between 1.2 and 2.4 million. If we mitigate the orange curve, you see that early on, we stay below the red line, but later on, we actually exceed it. And then we get a big peak. Uh, this is uh, an enlargement of the lower part of the graph. You see there's a big peak. Now, if you actually use suppression, you stay way below and you maintain it for a long period of time. However, you will, if you don't, uh, if you open up again, you will get a peak and you have to keep your eyes open continually. So what has to happen is after you, uh, after everybody comes out of this, uh, this um, suppression mode, then we have to monitor. And one of the trips for actually starting suppression again is if more than 100 people end up in an area in ICU beds with COVID-19. I'll show you another way of deciding when to actually go back into this mode. But as you can see, you have to do this repeatedly and, and eventually the outbreak will die down and the area under these curves will reduce. Now, one method, another method for doing this is using an electronic thermometer 
that actually connects with your iPhone, which then in turn uh, communicates with a central database. And then clinical infectious disease, they looked at the efficacy effectiveness of this in determining whether there was an influenza outbreak in the clinical infectious disease in 2018. This was the number of doctor visits for influenza-like illness. And here is the number of febrile patients in that area using the Kinsa. You can see very close correlation. In fact, the correlation was 0.95. Now, actually, the Kinsa thermometers have been used to create a weather map of, of uh, likely COVID-19 where the fever pattern was out of the ordinary. And you see here is Alachua County. Uh, you can see that's Alachua County. Look at the south. This is South Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, and Duval County, and the Tampa area, sorry, and this is actually Orange County. Here is Alachua County. We're sort of intermediate. So we've observed illness is low, atypical illness is moderate. So you're hearing a lot about antibody testing too. When is that gonna be used? Well, antibodies increase seven to 14 days into the infection with a rise in IgG and IgM. And here is just a curve showing uh, if you have severe an illness, you get a marked rise in IgG antibody at about 14 days. And while a mild illness, you get a moderate rise. So what the, by testing immunoglobulin, what you determine is whether someone has been exposed and infected. It doesn't tell you when they were infected, but it tells you they were infected. And therefore, they, we presume that they are immune. And if their, if their PCR is negative twice, they're no longer infectious and can go back to work. It will also be able to assess herd immunity. And it probably indicates that they are protected from recurrent infection, although that's still under investigation. So we have now, thanks to sheltering in place and closing schools and businesses, we have actually flattened the curve and we are below the capacity of our health systems. But the question is, now what? Um, we all are going to need to continue to socially distance. And the question that comes up is China, which is an authoritarian government, was able to maintain infection control. We are a democracy. How can we maintain isolation and keep control of this epidemic? It is going to require that those that are knowledge actually have to lead. What do I mean by that? Concerned professionals and citizens will have to lead the charge, encourage social distancing, testing, and case finding. But most important, to follow the science listen to those that are experts. So in order to get others on board, I recommend you uh, share personal stories of individuals you know that have infected, find other like-minded champions, write editorials, speak to your friends, talk to our leaders, hold virtual meetings such as this, and encourage everyone to listen to science, scientists and embrace science. We're all in this together. And I wanted to share a book by Giovanni Bocasio. It's called Decemeron. It was written in 1350. It describes the lessons of the Black Death. And what they, he described is people that didn't listen and decided to ignore the epidemic all died. So I don't think we need to repeat this lessons of the Black Death, we, in order not to do that, we must listen to epidemi epidemiologists and infectious disease experts. And you know, armed with this knowledge and by serving as leaders, you too can make a difference. Thank you. And I just wanted to show you these resources, which we will list. Uh, this is the website for the COVID-19 uh, Coursera course the link to the Right Care Alliance National Organization, the Right Care Alliance of Gainesville, and also a link to study groups where we are, we are actually studying, doing journal clubs, studying what the ideal health system should look like. And finally, I wanted to point out that thank Health Street for sponsoring this and to connect also with Health Street, who is very concerned about your health and well-being 
and sign up for their COVID-19 newsletter. Thank you. With that, we'll entertain questions. Okay, hello, I'm John Hutton, um, and I'm gonna be trying to organize people's questions and direct them to Dr. Southwick. So the first one that I want, that comes from Anne Wright is about uh, transmission from bats to humans, and how does animal, animal transmission work? How does animal, uh, I missed the last part of the question, you're breaking up a little bit. How, how does the disease, how do bats get this disease and how does it travel from bats to humans? Uh, it's, uh, it turns out that coronaviruses, I go, there are thousands of coronaviruses. They infect virtually the entire animal kidney. And bats, all, all bats have coronavirus in them. And so uh, the bat is unusual in that it's not really known why, but it is known that when you look at the, the mutation frequency, bats seem to have the highest frequency of mutations. And so what it was thought is this, this coronavirus mutated in this bat and then, then somehow was spread to the pangolin and that pangolin ended up in that market and that in turn in the market spread to those that worked in the market and those that worked in the market then spread it everywhere. And it was that mutation to the S protein that seems to have been uniquely effective at infecting humans. So it's a chance event. And uh, the bat, unfortunately, is a bit of a villain in this story. Okay. Um, another question was, who is spreading this virus? Is it, more, is it spread more by asymptomatic people or by super spreaders like the woman from South Korea? Um, we, we don't know how many super spreaders there are. Uh, this is the most dramatic example I've found in the literature, but we do think the majority of spread probably is those that have no symptoms. Symptomatic certainly do too. And probably then the counts variant counts in those that are, um, early symptoms are very high. And so those that have early, their first coughing, and the problem is this cough is really, can be really aggressive. People can't stop coughing. So if you're coughing, you are very infectious because you're spitting out those droplets at 1.5 meters and you're contaminating sites. But the surprise has been that those that don't seem to have symptoms, it turns out that even speaking to somebody, if you're talking to somebody at close range, you do spit out droplets unknowingly and therefore you can infect. And I, we think that what happened in Seattle, the first big outbreak, is someone that was asymptomatic went to a nursing home and talked to their loved one and then spread it to that loved one and then it spread like wildfire. And the problem is the elderly are like the canary in the coal mine. The elderly are far more likely to get symptomatic disease and very severe disease uh, requiring hospitalization and intensive care unit and they are far more likely to die. So uh, this is, that's what makes this such a frightening infection is this large population of asymptomatic individuals that can spread the disease. Okay, another question from Leo Zhu about uh, the spreading. He asked about face masks and if they should be mandatory or if the face mask can stop the spread of particles. Excellent question. And that relates to the, the droplet image that I showed you. And the answer is absolutely capital Y E S. And uh, uh, you know, it's, it's coming out that uh, certainly in the hospital now, we're all wearing masks, recognizing the problem of asymptomatic carriage. Since you can't know, you could come in contact or you could be an asymptomatic carrier and you wouldn't know. If you wear a mask, you will actually prevent yourself from spreading to others. And if you aren't infected, prevent yourself from uh, acquiring the infection. It looks, uh, the, there is a nice study in Nature Medicine that looked at the effectiveness of a cloth mask versus the surgical uh, throwaway mask. They're virtually equivalent, 92 versus 93% more effective. So a three-ply cloth mask is very effective. And the nice thing is you're not waste, ruining the environment with recycling 
of all this paper product. And so I really recommend the, uh, the cloth mask be wear, worn everywhere. Another important point that I'm emphasizing to our hospitalists, if you wear a mask, and you, in, in the case of the hospital, we have to have much more aggressive protective uh, um, equipment. But if you wear a mask, even if some of the virions make it through, you will get a low inoculum and you will have, it's highly likely, you will have a mild infection. If you're not wearing a mask and someone coughs directly on you, you will get a large dose of virion and you are far more likely to have severe disease and end up in an intensive care unit. And we have seen younger people get very serious disease, particularly in the hospital, you know, those that are caregivers, and it's almost always when they were intubating somebody or doing something that created a large aerosol, and therefore they got a huge dose of the virus, and that overwhelmed the immune system and resulted in very severe disease. So the mask will save your life. You should wear them everywhere. In addition to masks, what else can we be doing to prevent spread? Um, we want to wash our hands repeatedly and do not, when you've been in a possible contaminated area, wash your hands before you touch your face. Don't touch your eyes, your nose, or your mouth until you've washed your hands. Uh, carry alcohol around. Alcohol isn't as good as hand washing, but it's also effective. The other key is stay six feet away from anyone else. And when, you're, and when you're outside, if you're far away from others, you probably don't need to wear a mask. But if you go inside, you should always wear a mask because of the danger of someone might have had a sneeze that aerosolized. And there could be the little small droplets, we call them aerosolized droplets that are under 10 microns, could be floating in the air for several hours. And if you're not wearing a mask, you could breathe those in and get very sick. But if you're wearing a mask, so always wear a mask in a closed environment, always wash your hands, and then clean all your surfaces that you're using commonly with either a, um, a bleach-like solution, an alcohol-like solution, but don't use vinegar, it doesn't work. Okay, um, an interesting question relating to, well, it's from Pamela Gilbert and it says, can milder cases still cause damage to the lungs? Um, yes, um, it's very interesting. Mild disease, the, the, uh, the Chinese did a lot of CT scans. We aren't doing as many as they did, but they did CTs on, of the lungs in mild cases, and they found this little, it's called a ground glass or pacification in the lungs of even mild cases. Now that, uh, that damage is temporary in mild cases, it's thought, and should not cause permanent damage, but even mild cases can have significant lung involvement based on CT scans. Okay, and then a question from Gina Eubanks about reinfections. You had talked about the antibody tests at the end, but how likely are reinfections and do we know what they might look like? Um, at this point, there have not been any proven reinfections. The disease has been fairly short-lived. There have been what we call relapses. In other words, someone went PCR negative and then they got some new symptoms back and they did the PCR again and it was positive. So I think there have been a few relapses. Uh, this virus does, wreaks havoc on the immune system and I think it does impair immunity and we're seeing drastic reductions in lymphocytes, which are very important for uh, fighting this infection. And therefore the infection may be able to come, when we say relapse, means it never totally went away. It got better, but then it got worse. We have not, there hasn't been a proven case where there've been high antibodies, patient was asymptomatic, and a month later uh, developed uh, an infection, or two months later. So I think to say we've got a reinfection would probably be two to three months after the initial event and uh, with antibody levels. And I think that's gonna be very uh, uncommon, personally. And okay. you know, right now we can't say that antibodies are protective, but if it's like any of the other viruses in this class, I, I believe they, they're gonna turn out to be protective, but that's my personal opinion. Okay. Um, and then another question, uh, we've heard a lot about the flu 
recently. How would you compare this virus to the flu? Um, just to answer that common question. Yes, uh, the R sub zero for flu is about 1.2. In other words, one individual will affect 1.2 people on average. So it's far less infectious. It doesn't spread as effectively and efficiently. We don't know that there are very many asymptomatic individuals with influenza. The rule is when you develop symptoms, you become infectious. A very different than COVID-19. The other key difference is the mortality. There's a debate exactly what the case fatality ratio is. The case fatality ratio is calculated the number of deaths divided by the number of cases. Now, because there are so many asymptomatic cases we haven't uh, measured, the denominator is not totally clear. But uh, what we think is the average uh, case fatality rate is anywhere from 0 0.5 to, uh, to, to 3.5. That's the average. For uh, influenza, it's 0.1 is the case fatality rate. That means that COVID-19 is five to 35 times more deadly. So it's a much more serious disease because it spreads so much, easy, much easily and because it's, it's at least five times more deadly. Okay, here's an interesting question from Dr. Jamie Z. She's from Oral Health Providers Association. And her question is about what protection measures should be used by dentists. And if you have any advice for the dental community in this time. Wow, you know, dental, you know, because it's in the oral pharynx in high concentrations, it turns out when you look at the concentrations in the early phase of the disease, they are by far the highest in the nasopharynx and pharynx. So, uh, and then when it gets down in the lung, actually the counts go down a little bit. So you are in such great danger that I think the only way I personally would want to take care of somebody is if I knew they had negative COVID-19 testing at this juncture or had, been, had an illness and then were four weeks out and had a positive IgG. Uh, because you just don't know, and you could, you could, uh, it, it could be deadly. Now, I, I, I know you could mask yourself and use an N95, and possibly uh, that would be reasonably safe, but I, I don't know that that's being recommended. But I, you, if you're going to do that, you would need facial shield and N95 masks and gowns and gloves and you would have to be very careful on donning and taking, putting on and taking off those. It would be a very, very rigorous infection control if you were actually to take care of a patient. Now, there are some patients that are dental emergencies, and for those, that might make sense. But that's what you would have to do if you're going to take care of a patient uh, with a dental problem at this juncture. Okay. Um... There's a question about the use of different immune treatments. So is there any thought to the use of TNF blockers, interleukins, or MTX to curb the immune response? Um, yes, there are, there are monoclonal antibodies, silizumab and silizumab, that both uh, bind and, and uh, inactivate IL-6, which is one of the cytokines that has been seen to go up, and it does go up. I, we've tested it in a number of our patients. It does go up. Uh, normal is less than five, and the values that I've seen are between 25 and 30, although I'm sure they're much higher than that. Uh, so far, we don't know if that's beneficial. Uh, there, are, uh, there are controlled, randomized clinical controlled trials ongoing now. They have not been completed. The evidence is is just not there. Uh, as far as methotrexate, no, I would never use that. And also steroids have been found, corticosteroids, which also are immunomodulatory, have uh, been shown in SARS-1 and in uh, MERS to actually be harmful and to increase the viral load considerably. So they are, the WHO recommends against corticosteroids at this juncture. There's some debate in severe ARDS, but that's really open. 
at this point, I would not be using uh, uh, corticosteroids unless you're in a clinical controlled trial. Okay. There's another question um, going back to the animals that it comes from, the bat and the mandolin. Is it simply proximity being close to the animals or is it consumption? Uh, I think it's probably being close to it. I doubt if it's consumption because this virus is very sensitive to heat and it would be, if you cooked it, um, it would kill it immediately. Uh, that's the beauty of it. Any disin reasonable disinfectant will kill it. Um, and heating uh, your food over 165 will kill it. So it's not, it's highly unlikely to be foodborne. I think the probability of you getting it from packaging is very, very slim. If you were to get it, it would be a low inoculum, you'd get a low level infection. I think that my personal opinion, and it's not totally supported right now, is that it's mostly droplets and aerosol and maybe a massive contamination from hands to, to mouth. But I think that's very rare. And then in terms of other animals, there's a question about can animals get it in terms of pets and transfer it to their owner? Um, there have been now that there seems to be a market for doing PCRs in, in tigers in the zoo. And there's also been a couple cats and one or two dogs uh, however, there, to my knowledge, there is not a single reported case where uh, an animal has spread it, and, and you know, a pet has spread it to a human. So okay. yes, PCRs have been positive in some pets and animals, but no, they have not been spread to another to human as yet. So here's a question about testing. Um, it's asking why do we need to test people? who haven't been exposed or who might not have it? Um, the question is not exposed. The problem is, how do you know you're not exposed? If you talk to anybody within three feet of yourself at any time, you could have been exposed. That's the problem. So you, the, in order to uh, go to work or be with others in any kind of crowded environment, I think it's going to be a necessity to be tested and be cleared to are sure that you aren't infected. Now, the problem is, you know, you could go out and uh, next week and get infected again. And what do you do? I don't have a real answer for that. Um, it, it is a problem. But yes, we really need to test everyone um, if they're going to be around others. Because we don't know, we can't figure it's sim just symptoms is not that helpful. You miss at least nine patients for every symptomatic patient, and it could be as high as 50. Okay, and then here's a question from our friend Shirley, and she's asking if we're dealing with one virus or if there might be multiple viruses. Um, that, that's an interesting question. And uh, it turns out the good news is in humans, it seems that the mutations are very tiny as compared to the bat. So right now, there don't see any significant mutations that I've seen in the S protein, the knob protein, which is the, the, the protein where they're directing for ELISA assays and also for the vaccine. I think those are primary targets. So yes, there are little mutations. Uh, could they affect the, uh, the ability to cause disease? Possibly. But I don't think anybody at this point thinks there are, are multiple species out there causing disease. They seem to be very, very similar on a sequence level and only tiny mutations. Those mutations are helpful in deciding where, from an epidemiologic standpoint, to decide where they came from. For example, New York, they did uh, really full sequencing of the virus and they found the sequencing was much closer to the Italian virus than the Chinese virus. And that's how they concluded that it was tourists from the United States coming back from Italy that are responsible for the massive outbreak in New York City. Okay. And then here's a question similar to the question from our friend. It's about recommendations for precautions within the emer emergency medical service community. Yeah, the emergency medicine are, are really at high risk. That's one of our highest, the hospitalists and the ED 
are the two highest risk groups. I recommend, uh, you know, gowning, uh, you need facial shielding, you need an uh, M95, or I, I really like, you know, I tried to order for our hospitalists these facial shields. I ordered them two and a half weeks ago and I ordered 50 of them, I've gotten a single one. But if there are people, I think in the engineering that are actually making these facial shields, and I really like those because then uh, if anybody coughs, the shield itself is a great barrier. And then if you add a surgical mask, uh, probably the likelihood of aerosolized is, is very, very low. If you use an N95, virtually impossible for you to get infected. So I, I think the importance is always wear a mask the entire time you're in the emergency room working and always wear protective gear. And the other important thing, advice is be careful how you take off your material, your, your protective uh, uh, mask, et cetera, at the end of the day. You want to never touch the front of the mask. You want to touch the sides. You never want to touch the front of your gown. You want to touch the sides. And you never want to touch the glove, one glove with a bare hand. You want to make sure you take those off. There's a true technique to donning, taking these off. And then taking off the clothes that you wore for that day, you should remove them before you go into the house. Maybe put it in the garage or wherever and change in the garage and then wash those clothes. And warm water with detergent will kill the coronavirus nicely. So I think you have to be very cognizant of infection control and decontamination. Okay, um, I think we should end soon because we're coming close to six. I did have a specific question from Lorraine Mobley and it's about Sweden, which wasn't on the curve. It might be too specific if you know about Sweden's- No, I know about Sweden and uh, there's a big, there's a great interest in Sweden. First of all, Sweden is a very homogeneous country for the most part highly educated, very healthy population compared to the United States. So they decided not to shelter in place and to allow a low level infection to spread throughout their community. Uh, because there are fewer underlying diseases, they have not overwhelmed their health system. However, we were to do that in our country, we would go so far over the health system uh, that we would have to let people die in the streets. So I don't think that approach will work in the United States. Um, whether there's some other approach, I don't know. I'll leave it up to the epidemiologist. But we, if we were to use Sweden uh, as approach, we would probably uh, suffer with, from 1.2 million to 2.4 million deaths. And I don't think we want that. Okay, I wanna ask one more question about the disease and then that'll pretty much wrap us up. So. This is from Pamela Gilbert, and it's about clotting and kidney damage. Um, why is that? And is there any, and you, you had already talked about the virus going dormant and that being unlikely, but about clotting and kidney damage. Yeah, we, this is an area that's a great concern to all uh, healthcare providers. And we don't know. It definitely is tripping off the coagulase system in some unique and different way. I had one patient who was on Eliquis which is an anticoagulant, and they were not on a warfarin, but their INR, which is uh, usually rises with uh, warfarin, went up to five and six. So there was some serious derangement of the coagulation system. And we're seeing more episodes of stroke, we're seeing more myocardial infarcts, heart attacks, and we're seeing more higher incidence of thrombophlebitis. Exactly why and what to do about it, is still under investigation, but it is a great concern. Okay, and then the thing, and Jordan might be help us answer this, um, how can people watch this again? Is this recording gonna be available? So, yes, yeah, so we um, have it recording to Zoom Cloud, so soon we'll have a link out so people can watch the, the uh, recorded version. And we'll also share the link on the national our Right Care Alliance website, which is just rightcare.org, uh, rightcarealliance.org. And so you can find a lot of information there. If we are not able to answer your question during the webinar, we are going to do our best to share Dr. Southwest's 
uh, notes in a post webinar fact on our website and our social media, because there were a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to. There were a lot of questions, yes. Uh, by the way, the questions were excellent. I'm very impressed. Yeah. It shows we've got a very knowledgeable audience. And uh, I, I'd like to say on behalf of the Right Care Alliance and, and all of the panelists, uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. This was a, a fantastic turnout and such an important uh, topic. Uh, and I hope that you'll join us in the future as we have more events uh, and as we share. And, and by all means, join us. Uh, and, and we cover such a great variety of things. And, and we really uh, appreciate everybody's attendance tonight. Great. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Southwick, for your expertise and guidance. Thank you, Right Care Alliance, you. for hosting this important webinar. Um, and as we mentioned before, if you are interested in the services that Health Street provides, definitely go to myhealthstreet.org and check us out. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Bye.